Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco. We have another great guest episode today from the gentlemen of Reconsider. Reconsider is a podcast by Xander and Eric that takes on in-depth pressing political issues facing Western democracies with a fresh, researched, and challenging perspective. A reminder that both of our podcasts, mine and Reconsider, are part of the Agora Podcast Network, and the Agora Podcast of the Month is Wittenberg to Westphalia, which should interest listeners to this podcast, especially in a very short period of time, everything from warfare to art changed radically in Europe, in early modern Europe. And on Wittenberg to Westphalia, the Wars of the Reformation, Ben Jacobs uses the narrative of the Protestant Reformation and a large dose of humor to examine the stories and events of this critical period. So check that out as well. So many great podcasts to check out. So that's the plug for the podcast of the month. Remember, you can also hop over to englandcast.com to get links to today's shows, the archives, etc. And also it's contest time because I'm celebrating a really great review that my novel got from the host of the New Books in Historical Fiction podcast. So she wrote a really awesome review of my novel. I'm really happy about it. And so to celebrate, I'm giving away five copies of my novel. So you can go to englandcast.com and sign up there. I'm having the drawing later this week. And also it's five copies to five individual people. It's not like one person gets five copies because that would just be silly. (laughs) So head on over to englandcast.com to enter to win one of five copies. Okay, on to the show. Thanks so much, Eric and Xander, for this awesome guest episode. I loved it. And I'm fairly certain all of you listening are going to love it too. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. What a cool guy. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom. Super deep. Of the ocean buried. Totally buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wraiths. Our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Ouch. Our stern alarms changed to merry meetings. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, I am so fearful. He capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. Lutes really are quite lascivious. But I, that I'm not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that I'm rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I mean, can't blame him. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, set before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable the dogs bark at me as I halt by them. It's been a while since I've been halted by a dog. Why, I, in this weak piping time of peace have no delight to pass away the time wait what about the nymphs unless to see my shadow in the sun and to scant on mine own deformity and therefore since i cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair well-spoken days shouldn't you be entertaining nymphs i thought that was the whole point i am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days plots have i laid Inductions dangerous. Ooh, mischievous. By drunk prophecies. What other kind are there? Libels and dreams to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous. Yes. This day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Dun, dun. So welcome to English Renaissance History. As you may have guessed, we aren't Heather. Nope. This is Xander and Eric from the Reconsider podcast subbing in today. Yeah, we're so excited. We love Heather's show. English Renaissance History is a ton of fun to listen to, and I've learned a lot from it and gotten more excited about digging in. We're from Reconsider. We're another Agora podcast network member, and what we do is politics— not the English 
Renaissance history variety, but the contemporary variety, but we don't do the thinking for you. What we do is we provide historical, geopolitical, and structural context to what's going on in the world so that you can understand it better without the spin of the media and also better position yourself as a citizen making decisions in a democracy. So we ask folks to reconsider something in each show. And Heather brought us on today to help you reconsider a little bit of something that happened in Renaissance England. So let's get right into it. Heather did an episode a while back about Renaissance propaganda, especially as it related to certain portraits of Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth. If, if you haven't listened to it, check it out. It's a great episode. Heather mm -hmm. talks about how subtle metaphors and these illusions in these paintings were meant to solidify certain political images. And, you know, that, that kind of got us thinking. And today we're going to talk about propaganda as well, but a different type of propaganda. Yeah, some propaganda, like the Tudor paintings, creates a specific political image for contemporary use, where it tries to make you think about the people that are in power at the moment. And we're going to talk about another kind, the kind that crafts an historical narrative to usefully benefit the contemporary political leaders. So that's right. If you haven't figured it out yet, we're going to talk about Shakespeare's Tudor propaganda of the past. Now, Xander, I keep hearing something that some guy named Victor always writes history. What's up with that? It's a common name for historians. Apparently. So we're going to be talking about a lot of Victors today. So that intro that Xander read and, and I offered highly insightful commentary to is the introductory monologue to Richard III by Shakespeare. It's Richard III speaking after his brother Edward IV had unexpectedly died. And with the fourth, who'd been vying for power for decades with the Lancastrians, was uh, the patriarch of the York family. So Heather talks a little bit more in detail about this particular episode in, in English Renaissance history and the ascension of Henry VII in, in one of her earlier episodes, actually. But a long story, very long story, very short. The War of the Roses, it was a civil war between this one family called the Yorks and this other family called the Lancastrians. Can you think of more British names? I can't, really. But the Yorks kind of won for a while until Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII, killed Richard III, who was the last remaining York, at the Battle of Bosworth Field in uh, 1485, which basically ended the War of Roses, claimed a Lancastrian victory, and ushered in the age of the Tudor dynasty. Yeah, and the Battle of Bosworth is super interesting. It's one of the cooler, more wild, uh, and unexpected, dramatic battles in history. And I can only think of one more British name than the Yorks and Lancastrians, and it's Benedict Cumberbatch. That's the most British name I can ever think of. Now, a lot of historians, probably named Victor, mark Richard's defeat at Bosworth Field as the end of the late Middle Ages in England and the beginning of the Renaissance. And that means we're going to cheat just a tiny bit and talk a little bit about the late Middle Ages. But really, what does this Victor guy know anyway? Why does he get to decide when is the late Middle Ages and when's Renaissance? So we're just going to go for it. But the propaganda that you hear about this period, that's pure Renaissance Shakespeare, baby. Yeah, Shakespeare. I mean, if you were to think about this classic arch evil supervillain, it is Shakespeare's Richard III. Not only does he scheme against his family, kill his nephews, and plot Ugh. for really superficial personal game. He was also physically deformed. He was this hunchback, which in Shakespeare's audience's mind would have been seen as a, you know, a clear sign from the powers of the universe that this guy is marked as really evil, evil, evil. But he also seems to enjoy being evil. So he says, And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. I mean, really, he's just, he's no fun, right? So basically, I'm bored. I'm going to be a super evil dude. If I can't fun that, have fun, then nobody can. And it kind of reminds me of that Eddie Izzard skit about Hitler's moment of truth, where he's, he's painting, you know, in art school, and he goes, ah, damn trees, I can't get the... I, I, God, I, I shall kill everyone that's involved. I mean, that's basically what, what happened with Richard. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty famous literary depiction. Not Eddie Izzard, Shakespeare, of what some would call a sociopath, you know, some this character who does evil for the sake of entertainment. Kevin Spacey, 
the famous actor, the guy who plays President Frank Underwood in House of Cards, has talked about how he basically based this character uh, in House of Cards on Richard III. And it's it's just basically impossible to like Shakespeare's Richard III. You know, it's, it's interesting. Actually, Kevin Spacey plays Richard III in a production, and you can go on YouTube and kind of hear him talking about how he formed his character for being in this role. And he talks about how, you know, oh, Richard III is just this archetype for this evil person. And it's just really interesting because it's just not necessarily grounded in full historical context. But that's what we're going to talk about today. The question is, you know, how accurate is this presentation of Richard III? Yeah, how evil is he really? And this idea of Richard III really being a monster has lasted to the modern day. It's what a lot of people believe. He's attributed with killing his nephews, the sons of Edward IV, including Edward V, uh, who is the heir to the throne. So he locks them up in a tower and nobody sees them and he either stars them to death or poisons them or puts a blade through them or has them tripped down the stairs or something like that. He's accused of plotting against his brother, the king, to bring him down and take power for himself. And a big part of this evil interpretation of him comes from the lasting image that Shakespeare painted in this play. But we have reason to be doubtful of Shakespeare's portrayal of Richard III. First and most importantly, his name is William, not Victor, and therefore he is not a historian. But there are other reasons to doubt him as well. Yeah, I mean, let's think about this for a second, right? Richard III was the last Plantagenet king, and without getting into detail of the long and confusing line of British monarchs, I mean, basically both Yorks and Lancastrians fall into this Plantagenet family. So Richard III was the last. He was the last of the House of York before he got crushed by Henry Tudor. And it's important to remember that Shakespeare lived in an England that was ruled by the granddaughter of the king that beat Richard III at Bosworth Field. So just as with any crime, we need to think about this potential character assassination from the perspective of motive. And how did artists get by back in the 17th century? By, of course, the largesse of wealthy patrons, including, as it turns out, Elizabeth I, particularly in the case of old Billy there. Now, for most monarchs, it's pretty important to have, you know, a credible claim to legitimacy of some sort. So if the people don't think that the monarch has a mandate to rule, well, there start to be problems. That's where you get rebellions left and right, which we know British history is kind of full of. And Henry Tudor happened to have a pretty weak bloodline claim to the throne compared to Richard. So this seems a little bit suspicious. Yeah, Henry VII took the throne... The, the English throne, you know, the good old-fashioned way with the sword. Paid the iron price. Oh, thank you for the Game of Thrones reference. You're welcome. And by getting his enemy Richard III's his friends to turn against him. The problem with a monarch taking power with the sword is that it raises this issue of legitimacy. Does this person really have the right to rule? Well, the thing with taking power with the sword is that you probably can just kill whoever asked those questions, right? Well, you can't kill everyone who asks that question, right? I mean, you, at some point, your subjects need to believe that you, their monarch, are the rightful ruler, or else you're going to be king of a pile of bodies, right? So you've got to be appointed by God, in particular, if your conventional claim of primogeniture uh, is, is pretty weak, as it turns out, for Henry Tudor. So you got to have people say that, oh, yeah, God totally wanted me to kill that guy because he was terrible. Ain't that right, Victor? Yeah, and since Richard III had a much stronger claim than Henry VII, this Tudor king-to-be really needed a reason to justify his ascension to the throne by force. Enter propaganda. And as you've noticed, the victors write history. These victors were working for this particular victor. Say that ten times fast. It would be much easier to justify Henry VII's and therefore Henry VIII and Elizabeth I's rule if the people think that Henry VII kicked out this morally base, traitorous, usurper king. And even if that king did have a better claim to the throne, well, maybe if he painted him as a sufficiently evil guy, a guy it just wouldn't matter. Right, so the English don't have this idea of the mandate of heaven quite the way that the Chinese do, but if you're going to be interrupting the legal inheritance method, primogeniture, it better be because 
the old king was so bad that God would have been like, yeah, totally, take that guy out. He's no good for the Brits. So let's add some specifics here. Starting with just the superficial. Richard III's physical form. Shakespeare depicts Richard III as a really deformed hunchback, quasi-moto level, and his physical deformity is supposed to add to this archetype that he is a monster and therefore not fit for the throne. But how deformed was he really? Well, let's think about this. He, Richard III actively fought in this Battle of Bosworth on a horse leading his troops into battle. And if you know anything about medieval battle, uh, wasn't exactly a walk in the park. And it, it, this guy didn't just chill in the back behind some protective lines either. In fact, at one pivotal point in this battle, Richard III saw a clear shot to Henry Tudor, who was right there on the battlefield as well, and personally led a charge deep into enemy ranks to try to kill his opponent mano a mano and just end the battle right there and then because so frequently with these medieval battles if you can cut the head off the snake that was that was it so while Laurence Olivier portrays Richard III as this guy who's just you know barely able to walk dragging his foot behind him due to all of these physical deformities the real Richard III was sufficiently not deformed enough to handle horse and fight hand-to-hand -hand in the chaos that was medieval battle. Which, by the way, I, I'm not all that deformed, and I couldn't do that. So good on him, right? And to further build some evidence into this, it turns out they dug up Richard III in 2012, in part to answer this question. Turns out there's a Richard III like, defense club that wants to... <laughs> it's true. They want to you know. write his... Uh, his place in history and, and undo the tarnish on his, his good name. And when they dug him up, it turns out that Richard did show signs of having scoliosis, but just not in a way that made him so physically deformed as to impede his day-to-day -day activities, including battling and chopping things and drinking and, you know, whatever else kings do. Even though Shakespeare depicted him this way, it's just not true. And as for the nephews... Heather actually talks about this some on, on her show on Henry VII. But there are plenty of reasons to actually believe that Richard III, with the princes, acted in good faith. And that either someone else was involved in the murder, or he simply moved them away from court life and didn't kill them. And if they were killed, it might have been someone trying to please Richard III, even though it wasn't his order. What happened to the late Edward IV's sons has been fiercely debated by historians, and, and a whole lot of people had motives to kill them. Now, of course, Richard did need them sort of out of the way because they had a rival claim to the throne. But in the end, nobody actually knows what happened to the princes in the tower, and it turns out it is neither rare nor, in some regards, from the morality of the time, all that unreasonable to take rival claimants to the throne and get rid of them, right? Because like that's important for stability. Yeah, I mean, a lot of historians talk about Richard III, and they say, you know, so much has been focused on his moral character, but, you know, contemporary historians tend to focus a little bit less on issues like that, and they say we need to consider his actions in the context of his time, and it's a really bloody, difficult time to be in, in the nobility in England, in late 15th century England, so you need to judge his actions based on what he, he was dealt with. And from that perspective, there, there were some arguably decent governing decisions that Richard III made that kind of get lost in the Tudor-friendly telling that tend to focus more on the disappearance of these nephews. For example, Richard III is credited with institutionalizing what was called the Council of North, the Council of the North, which brought regional governance under a more central control, which let that central power then punish lawbreakers and more effectively resolve land disputes. So real practical governing measures. Sounds pretty cool. Richard III also created the Court of Requests, which let people who couldn't afford legal representation to have their case heard. Pretty progressive. He passed laws to protect individuals who were indicted for crimes for being imprisoned and having their property taken from them before they were declared guilty. I mean, how cool is that, right? We kind of take that for granted, but that wasn't a thing before Richard III. And he also lifted restrictions on the sale of books and printing. I mean, seriously, restrictions on books. Who does that, right? Well, I guess people who want to keep the, the people under the heel of ignorance as well as absolute power. So Richard III is starting to look like a pretty good guy. 
And there's this contemporary historian, I don't know his name, but it's probably Victor, and I'm just going to lift this language from the Wikipedia page, called him a good lord who punished oppressors of the commons, adding that Richard III had a great heart. Now, there's a bunch more examples of this on the Wikipedia page. You know how to get there. But even a quick glance at this king begins to seem far more complex and multifaceted and maybe kind of cool than Shakespeare's claim that he was determined to prove a villain, right? And, oh, did we did we forget to mention that Henry totally had a French-funded invasion fleet when he came to take the throne? I mean, that's right. This guy was a total foreign lackey. Don't hear about that in Shakespeare, do we? No, not usually. Uh, and, you know, frankly, for what it's worth, this propaganda aspect is a reason why I personally tend to like some of Shakespeare's older histor- uh, histories, like Julius Caesar, a little bit more. He still took liberties with the narrative in Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, but because he was so far removed, both temporally and politically, from ancient Rome, that afforded him to read a little bit more neutrally into the histories that he had available to him at the time. Yeah, he actually does the same character assassination to Macbeth, who is actually a totally reasonable dude in Scotland. I mean, it was a tough time, but he wasn't like running around murdering everyone and consorting with witches or any of that stuff. Turns out, turns out there weren't any witches. Really? Really. Oh, man. Yeah, it's, I know, it's disappointing. Now, on Reconsider, we like to discuss one main topic each, each show and then ask our listeners to reconsider their position. So... Let's think about the reputation that Richard III has retained for half a millennium after his death. I mean, that's a long time, right? It is a long time. And all the motivations that people like Henry Tudor and Shakespeare had in perpetuating this narrative through really what amounted to very well-written propaganda. I had very well-written. Now, given that that perception was so powerful as to persist for so long, what we want to ask you to reconsider is what other narratives do you know that are just 100% true that you might have just taken at face value? Are there any narratives that are so central to how you interpret the state of the world today that if they changed, would shake your perspective? And that's the power of reconsidering history which is why you need to keep listening to Renaissance English History Podcast. I mean, I think Heather has a really strong finger on the pulse of what was the narrative then and and what have we learned over hundreds of years of scholars studying what was actually happening on the ground. Questioning and investigating the past, of course, teaches us about today and helps us better understand what tides in history have actually occurred and what's likely to recur. And English Renaissance history is, I think, extremely relevant to U.S. culture, since in particular it was the age that immediately preceded Enlightenment philosophy, and in particular English Enlightenment philosophy and governance style that birthed so many of the political ideas in the United States and other democracies around the world that we sort of take as gospel today, that we think are just obvious. And what's so cool about Renaissance history in England was that we were starting to see, I mean, even with Richard III, these liberal ideas start to take root, and we start to see some of the arguments for why these should be happening. Um, And I think understanding those is really important to understanding not only how our government came about as it did, or our governments came about as they did, but also help us actually understand why we believe what we do And help us to start think about like, oh, this democracy thing or this liberty thing, like what is the, what's the basis of it? And like, where are the, where can I start questioning, um, you know, some of the way that our current government works uh, as opposed to just take it for granted. So anyway, we hope you guys had fun thinking about Richard III. If you decide you want to check us out at Reconsider, you can find us at ReconsiderMedia.com. You can find the Reconsider podcast at Overcast, iTunes, Google Play, Acast, or you can just RSS it from our website. You can also get in touch with us at Reconsider Pod on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to have you, and we'd love to get some ideas from you on what you really want to hear about from us. So we're going to give you guys a twist on our normal sign-off 
first, thanks so much to Heather for having us on. Uh, we had a lot of fun researching this, and we hope you had a lot, lot of fun listening to it. And as you go forward, remember, don't let the 17th century poets do the thinking for you. Stop and reconsider. This is Eric signing off. And this is Andrew signing off. <laughs> <laughs>